going to be in 1 Peter. If you have a Bible, feel free to grab that. You can use iPads, iPhones, version's a good Bible. There's Bibles in the chairs in front of you and Bibles out on the Welcome Center if you don't have one of your own. Feel free to grab one of those. So 1 Peter's where we're going to be at. 1 Peter 1, we're going to be in verses 3 through 12. I'm going to read them and they'll be on the screen. And uh, as you're finding that, uh, just a, a kind of a bit more information on this idea of Advent. If you don't know about the, the liturgical Christmas calendar, or not Christmas, the Christian calendar, uh, the Christian calendar starts with Advent. It doesn't actually start at Christmas. It starts with Advent. And the reason that Advent begins the, the Christian calendar, in particular the Christmas calendar, is because the early church fathers wanted to root us in, in, in the hope that would not disappoint us. And, and as we've all probably experienced, and as you've seen, secular Christmas makes all sorts of promises that it, it can't keep, Right? It's, it's all this build-up and all the advertisements and all the decorations and the sales and the, the food and the shopping and, and all of that, yet all of that is simply for consumerism, right? When there's no greater meaning behind it, it's ultimately empty and, and lacking. And what I want to do today is to talk to you about what we've been given that, that we won't have to put away in a couple of weeks when Christmas is all over, right? When all the decorations put away, we have something as Christians we don't have to put away. And I want to talk about that thing that's not going to go anywhere, that you and I have been gifted with in the coming of Jesus Christ, that as we'll read in the text today, the things that, that won't fade, that, that can't be defiled, that will be ours for forever, and with that said, let's take a look at what we've been given in the coming of Jesus Christ and why that's better than just Christmas all by itself in a secular sense. And then after that, I'll close with a little bit of an idea of how it is that we live in a privileged position in history. So join me in First Peter 1, 3 through 12, and I'm going to read that. There it reads, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who, by God's power, are being guided through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. If you didn't notice, there's no punctuation there, and that's the way Peter writes it. It's one of the longest sentences you will ever read, right? I'm going to continue on. He's got a couple of doozies here that are long sentences. He says, In this, in this, you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to the result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what the person or time, what the person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Now as we get started here, look back at the beginning there in verse 3. And we see this. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that word blessed there is, is one of those chock full of meaning kinds of words that you find in the Bible. And, and, and it means like, you know, glory be, blessed be, uh, praise be to our God, right? To our God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and why is it Peter says this? Well, he gives us this gift, right? Here's this gift that we've been given. The gift that we've been given as believers in Christ, this greatest gift of all throughout the Christmas celebration, is the idea that we have been given new life. That is the greatest gift of all as we celebrate Christmas. 
And it's this new life that was not according to our doing, but as it says there, according to the great mercy of God. And this, this blessed be, praised be, glory be to God in this text is because you and I have been given this wonderful, amazing, beyond imagination gift of new life. And as I said, it's this new life that's rooted not in what I have done. In fact, it could never be in anything that I've done. I would mess it up if it was on me, right? And it's what God is being praised for here in this text, is that He is this great initiator of of new life, of new birth, of renewal, of transformation. He's recreating, as we were talking about in the book of John before, right? And in the same way that we had no say in our physical birth, He's come in and, and, and given us this opportunity as a gift to us. And so... We didn't create that opportunity. God did, and and He offers it to us and and, and gives us this chance for a a spiritual new and rebirth, right? And so Jesus has been revealed to us by the Spirit of God, it says. And then as we've been in that, then, we are adopted as sons and daughters of the God on Most High. And so Peter is saying here, Praised be. Blessed be, glory be to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who who made us as sons and daughters. We're adopted. We're engrafted. Who's made us as sons and daughters. Who has given us new life. And that new life is marked by living hope. I love that phrase. I love, I love those words put together, that, that idea of living hope, right? Living hope is the opposite of disappointment. Now all of us have experienced disappointment, I would imagine, right? We've experienced it. You live for very long, you're going to be disappointed. And living hope is the opposite of that. And if you think about how much of your life has been marked by disappointment you'll see that your level of disappointment is directly related to the things that you've put your hope in. Your experience of disappointment is directly connected to where exactly it is that you have placed your hope. And let's be honest, right? If your hope is that that your spouse is going to fix all of the things that feel off in you, you're going to be disappointed, and frankly, they're going to be disappointed too, right? If your hope is that you'll be able to to manage and control your environment with your job or with promotions or with your parenting, you're going to be really, really disappointed, right? If your hope is that you can control your own health, that if you can eat enough spinach and do enough push-ups, you'll live forever, right? Right? If that's where you're putting your hope, you're going to be disappointed. And the argument that's happening here in this passage is that that new life that you've been given, and that in that, through Christ Jesus, there is a living hope. A, A hope that will not disappoint. Because in that, our hope is rightly placed. New life in Christ means our hope is life in Christ. Our hope is that I'm going to follow Christ, and I'm going to say yes to Christ, and I'm going to take steps of faith. I'm going to, I'm going to risk some things in that. I'm going to put myself out there a little bit by faith, knowing that, that Christ will be enough, regardless of life's circumstances. And this is what faith moving forward looks like. It's living hope. I trust. I trust that God is good, right? And I'm going to follow Him wherever it is He is leading me, even if in that moment things might be difficult or painful. Even in those tough times, I'm going to say yes. I'm going to say yes to Him. I'm going to follow Him because He is the living hope. Because I don't think Jesus is going to disappoint me. Now, Jesus will disappoint you if you're trying to use him to get something that you really want. Because that means then that 
that you've then placed your hope uh, in, in the wrong thing. You're not, your hope isn't into Jesus, it's into that thing you will get because of the association. You're trying to use Christ to get something, and that's not the way it works. The living hope that is in Christ, though, if we put our hope and trust in Him, we believe then that is enough. That through Christ I'm betting all in, putting all my chips in on Him, trusting that He will be enough. This is our living hope. And what is this based on then? And as it says, it's based on God's mercy, not on something we do. And to me, that's the the very best news of all of this text. That, That steadfast, unmovable, rooted life, death and resurrection of Jesus. That is where it's at. That is where our hope and trust is put in. Not something that changes. Not something that's on our whims. Not something from our emotions. That it's on Jesus. And that is our confidence. And where do we get that confidence? That crazy confidence, some would say, right? Well, again, the the text helps us here. And it says, Born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Well, how can I believe all of this is true, of course? We talked more about this at Easter, so come back at that time if, if you haven't heard that story. But how can we have this hope, right? Where, where does this hope come from? This hope that the outside world looks at and says, y'all are a bit crazy believing in that stuff. But we go, no, that is where, where our hope is. How can we believe this is true? It's because I can look and see that Jesus isn't in the grave. Which means that all of my sins have been paid for. All of the sins for those who believe in the name of Jesus have been forgiven. See, here's one of the uh, almost mind-blowing things about Jesus and the Bible and this whole system. You see, all of our sins, you and me, everyone hearing my voice right now, all of our sins were future sins when Christ died on the cross. We hadn't sinned yet. And yet, He had a plan for you and me. And despite our sin not happening yet, our future sins not having taken place, He rose from the grave as a sign of His conquering sin and death for us. Which means that all of my sins that are future sins, when He died and rose, which means that His blood was covering things that hadn't even happened yet. That God foreknew. He had the knowledge of the future. He knew I was a screw-up. I hadn't even been born yet. But he knew I was going to need him. And so he sent him for you and for me. And this has been given to us. This is new life. Given for you, given for me. And that, that promise and the assurance that we can have as we put our hope and trust in Christ isn't going to go anywhere. I've been given new life through the coming of Jesus Christ. Another gift that we have been given is that we've been given an inheritance, right? Look at verse 4. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. I love those words as I read them. They're so descriptive, you know. Imperishable, undefiled, unfading, it says in my translation. And and that just described what God can do that nothing else in all of creation can accomplish. And fundamentally, we know this is true. Anything that you open from under your Christmas tree on Christmas Day, I don't care how cool it is, I don't care how good it is, I don't care how expensive it was, I don't care what it is, Anything you open on Christmas Day is destined for a landfill someday. Right? Merry Christmas. But it is. Right? All those things are going to fade. And if you have children, you know this to be true, right? 
I gave my son a gift a few years ago, right? And he was so excited. He's like jumping up and down excited, right? All of us have been there. Just joy, delight. And then like six days later, Dad, I'm bored. I'm like, didn't you ju- just, what? Uh, new Christmas, what? You're bored already? Now, to his credit, I think actually six days is pretty long. I mean, some kids, it's like six hours. Like, Dad, I'm bored already, right? But that's not just an experience we have only as kids. It's an experience we all actually have. Because we were meant for eternal things. Therefore, temporal things cannot do it for us. They can only satisfy temporarily. That's why it doesn't take very long for us to become acclimated to things like beauty, right? Uh, I've lived in a number of different areas, and uh, you quickly become acclimated to the beauty of those areas. We take for granted the beauty of the places in which we live, for instance, right? So when I moved up here to to Glory, to Aiken, the first few times I drove Deer Street, pine trees and sunlight, and it was beautiful. Now it's like, where's the next deer? (laughs) Y'all know what I mean, right? Occasionally it still catches me with some beauty as the trees get flocked at the beginning of the year or the colors change, you know? A few times a year it still catches my eye, but you become acclimated. Uh, another, another place where you see this is, uh, I grew up on the plains. I grew up in South Dakota. When I go back to South Dakota now, having lived up here for a while, every night there is a sunset that is spectacular because there's nothing blocking your view, right? Go to North Dakota, go to South Dakota, go to Kansas, go to one of those flat states where there's no trees. And sunsets are amazing because you can see them all. But after a couple of days living there again, you're like, eh, another sunset, whatever. You live in the mountains, right? Mountains are gorgeous. They're beautiful. I lived in the mountains of New Mexico for three summers, and quickly you, you just kind of take for granted the sound of the wind blowing through the pines. You take for granted the bubbling of the brook, because it just becomes the norm, right? And that, that happens to us. It doesn't just happen to kids at Christmas. Uh, another place we might see it is, uh, this is a place of, maybe for younger than older folks, but like you hear that new song, and you love that new song, right? And you put that new song on repeat, and you want to listen to that song multiple times a day, every single day, because you love that song. And you listen to it again and again and again. And then like six weeks later, you're like, meh, you moved on to another song, Right? Or if you're like me, you know, I'm a 45-year-old, I have boxes of CDs covered in dust. And in fact, I have to really think about it to find somewhere I can even play those stupid things now, right? Like, I don't have a CD player readily accessible. I mean, I have one in my car, but it's a hassle to bring CD all the way out of the car, especially with, you know, modern phones. It's the law of diminishing returns. You were created for eternal things. Therefore, temporal, temporary things cannot satisfy you except for temporarily. The promise, the gift in our inheritance is kept in heaven for us, it says, by faith and salvation. That promise is unfettered access to God, a a new resurrection body, a brand new heaven and earth, as we are told in the book of Revelation, remade for us to, to, to reign and rule alongside of Jesus for eternity. That is our inheritance. And that hope should strengthen us for today. Because if my hope is in something that can't be taken away, because it's stored up, it's treasured for me in heaven, if that is where I have my hope, my hope is that my inheritance is that 10,000 years from now in a resurrected body and a new heaven and a new earth and a new kingdom reigning and ruling, hanging out with Jesus and everything is going to be awesome. There's going to be no more sin. There's going to be no more death and no more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more suffering. It's going to be awesome. That's where we were created to be. That's what we were created for. We're going to be there. If that's where my hope is, then I have something that will endure 
It's not going to fade away and be thrown in the dump someday. So that gift is our inheritance. One of the things that I've always appreciated about the Bible, even since I was a, a brand new believer, is that if you read it honestly, the Bible isn't just kind of unicorns and cotton candy, right? It's not all puppy kisses and smiles. The Bible is, is honest about life in many places. And it shows us kind of that, that grit of being human, of living life here on earth. And, and Peter actually does that for us in this passage, if you caught that. You've got this beautiful passage about uh, all these great gifts, this, this, this happening of life. And not being disappointed in, in, in this new hope, in this new life, in this forevermore inheritance that we have, this, the thing that's undefiled and imperishable. And you have all of these gorgeous big promises there to begin with. And then look at verse 6, right? He says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You've got this beautiful passage here with all of these promises, but then he's like, but I know what it's like to live in this world, right? I know what it's like to experience the human condition. He knows what it's like to live in a, a fallen world, and so he just kind of steps in there with, and you're going to face some trials, right? I mean, you got all this good stuff, all these great gifts, but it's not all puppy dog kisses. And yeah, that's a good reminder for us at this time of year, right? Christmas is dressed up with, we talk about it, and we got all these celebrations and all these decorations and all of this fun and all of these events and rush, 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 go, 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 fun, 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 joy, joy, joy all of that. But the truth is, this time of year, not everybody feels that. Right? Not everybody feels that joy. And if you're low, this time of year can make you feel really low. If you're lonely, this, kind, this time of year can, can make you feel extra lonely. If you're depressed, it can get extra depressing. And part of that, more often than not, is because our focus is on the wrong things. A lot of times we look at other people and we see what they are doing. We see what they have and we feel like what we have is not enough. We, we look on Instagram or we watch, oh, this is the one, the Hallmark Channel. <laughs> right? You watch that and you think, every house is beautifully decorated, every driveway is surrounded by 24 inches of snow, but is perfectly clean and clear with no snow on the ground, on the driveway. The walkways are perfectly straight. The cement is perfectly clean. The dogs all do their business somewhere else. This is the Hallmark Channel, right? But we kind of look at that, and maybe not exactly that, but we look at that and we feel like what we have isn't enough. And, and it can cause us to kind of spiral further down if we were already heading that direction. Moving us towards darkness rather than putting our hope in Christ and His sufficiency. And so Peter here is willing to acknowledge that that, that is part of our condition, that is part of our experience, that is part of what it is to live through this life on earth. But there is more to that that we are called to and I want to try to help us today by, by pointing out that the Bible, as it looks at this, it doesn't conceive of faith as a single solitary event or experience. It's not a singular act. But our faith is something that has to happen over and over and over again. We have to keep moving forward and growing and moving in faith and, and, and becoming more and more Christ-like, even in those times where we're feeling that that down, that loss. We have to turn to Christ even in those moments. As we navigate the, the difficulties of life, as we 
work our way through the struggles as we feel lonely and depressed. We have to choose to put our faith back into what we pledged to originally in our faith. That as, as we were first saved and we put our hope in Jesus, we need to sometimes remind ourselves that, yeah, I'm feeling down a little bit today. Yeah, I'm, this is something that's really hurting me. But I have something greater in store for me. I might be perplexed. I might feel like, like I'm being crushed. crushed. I'm, I might feel like I'm being confused. I might be angry. But I can look at the cross and remember the resurrection and trust that God is good, even if it doesn't feel real good right now. And, and Peter doesn't sugarcoat anything here. He's being really honest about our experience. He says, this is part of it. As you walk through this world, there's going to be various trials and sufferings and pain. But there's something greater to come. And then I love how this ends. Peter says, concerning the salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was yours, or that was to be yours, searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you. In the things that uh, have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. What's being described here is a truly profound thing. This passage tells us and shares with us that you and I live in a privileged position in redemptive history. You and I, this is one of the additional gifts that we have been given, right? This is the third gift if you're keeping track of the gifts today. The third gift that we've been given is that we have a, a special position in redemptive history. That we live in a time where we get to see the fulfillment of the prophets' prophecies concerning the, the coming Messiah and the salvation of the nations. We have a, a better seat on this side of the cross than all those guys who wrote the Old Testament. We have a better seat as far as the history of salvation goes than Isaiah, right? Right? He's a guy who got a little view into heaven one day, right? Remember his woe is me, I have unclean lips. And yet, the Bible tells us we have it better than him. We have it better than Jeremiah. We have it better than all those Old Testament guys. We have a, a better position than them in the view of redemptive history. And then there's this little line that closes it. It says, the things into which the angels long to look. You might think that's just an odd little tack on, but it's not. Throughout the, the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, we read about these other spiritual beings, right? That, that, are, that are in some ways greater than humans, but less than God. And we can see as we read and study about the angels that they have varying ranks and varying jobs. And when it comes to the first advent of Jesus, they're, they're everywhere in the story, right? You got this angel that shows up to, to Zachariah when he's, you know, working as a priest. And it's like, that's Gabriel, and he's like, hey, Zachariah, how's it going today? Uh, your wife's going to have a baby. Zachariah's like, she ain't having no baby, she's like 140. That might be the translation according to Chris. But he's like, no, she's, she's too old to have a baby. And the angel's like, you're having a baby, and you're naming him John. And then Zachariah, of course, is mute until the baby's born. And then Gabriel shows up again to, to Mary, right? And then shows up to Joseph. And then, as we're going to cover next weekend, he shows up to the shepherds. And then the whole sky is filled and it explodes with rejoicing angels that Jesus is coming. And Peter is saying here, that this group of supernaturally, otherworldly, spiritual beings, these beings who are, are, are in a sense far more powerful than we are, these, these, these beings that when they show up, they're, they're terrifyingly brilliant in their presence, that, that 
if we're not careful, we would be tempted to actually worship them. Like if an angel showed up on stage here, there would be a temptation to worship him because he's going to look so awesome. I just talked about this with the kids on Wednesday night. Like, like when we think of angels sometimes, we think of, you know, angel soft toilet paper, little babies on clouds, you know, playing harps. But that's, that's not the, the angels of the Bible. When you, when you read about the angels in the Bible, these are, I, I think of like warriors, buff dudes, strong dudes coming to fight. They're coming to kick the rear end of the devil. They're here to fight demons, right? They're, they're big, they're bad, they're mean, they're strong. And they got the glow, you know? Uh, I, I kind of think of like the Macho Man Randy Savage, if you watch wrestling. Or uh, pick your favorite wrestler, not one of the chubby ones, one of the buff ones. That's kind of how I, you know, think of angels. Somebody, we, we would be terrified if he showed up. And, and those angels, the Bible says here through Peter, those angels look at our salvation and it blows their mind. <coughs> they want to they, they wanna try to understand, what, what is God doing here by saving us? We're a bunch of screw-ups, right? Remember the angels, they made one mistake and a bunch of them got kicked out. And looking at us going, these guys are making one, two, three, I can't even count. They made a bunch of mistakes, but you still love them? And the text here is calling us to a kind of rejoicing that is, well, I'll read the next text. It says, though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The angels look at us and they're jealous, right? And unfortunately for so many of us, our rejoicer is broken, right? Our joy should lead to inexpressible rejoicing, but our rejoicer is kind of broken. It's been dampered at least. Because we live in a a messed up, broken world that... kind of pulls down our level of rejoicing. When you have various trials and struggles, it's easy to lose focus on God who is good. But I would encourage you in this season, remember that God is at work in the mess anyhow. Turn your eyes to Jesus. Look to Him. Because Jesus is accomplishing something in the middle of your mess. That whatever it is that you might go through, if this is a tough time of year for you, that Jesus hasn't forgotten you and it's not for nothing. Put your hope in the right thing and look at it in the long term. As we are disappointed, our disappointments can kind of be like an x-ray machine showing us where we've misplaced our hope. And if you don't have hope, if you don't understand hope, if you don't know what the hope is in this thing that we've been talking about this whole time about Jesus, know that today He offers you eternal life. God has created you for something more than this. I'm not saying this is all bad, but there is something greater for every single one of us. And God knows all the bad things you've done. He loves you anyhow. God has seen all of your sins, all of your mistakes, all of your mess up. He knows all the junk of your life. He's seen your sins and He offers to take them, take them away from you anyhow. He knows your pain. And He will walk with you in it. Not only will He walk with you in it, if you will let Him, He will try to heal you through it. This inheritance can be yours. This new life gift can be yours. Now, I've done ministry long enough to know that there's people even now who are saying, well, pastor, you don't know what I've done. You you, you can say that, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I'm guilty of. And you don't know what I'm guilty of either. You don't know what I've done either, right? But I just want to continually plead with you to get over yourself and know that it doesn't matter what you have done is what he has done that is where our hope is in this season 
Our hope is in Jesus Christ. If there was a a sin that could defeat the grace of Christ, Jesus would still be in the grave. But he's not in the grave. He's alive, and we're waiting on the second advent. Which means that there is no sin with more power than the power in the cross of Christ. So just as much as I am proclaiming today, I'm also inviting you, if you don't have this gift, to join in and take this gift of new life, to take this gift of this inheritance, to take this gift to strengthen you for this journey that is sometimes not all that easy through this life. And then in that, embrace the promise that God is good, that God is kind, that He's not forgotten you, He's not forsaken you, He's not abandoned you, but He loves you. He loves you so much that he sent his son. That is what we are looking forward to. That is what Advent is. Let's pray.